Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 5, Episode 19, titled Leap of Faith. Before I move on, I just want to point out, the episode numbers might sound like they're out of order to you, because if you look at how it aired on NBC and then The Lost and then Too Little Too Late, is that this would technically be Episode 20, because Free Fall is technically Episode 17. We're counting Free Fall as Episode 21. So if it seems out of order, the episode numbers are out of order, because we're counting it in order it was written. So this is, as we're calling it, Episode 19. Any of you stat nerds, with your black glasses and you want to push them up on your nose and tell us about which episode number this actually is, we know. It originally premiered on June 28, 1989. It is written by Robert Ward, who wrote the last two episodes and Redemption in Blood, Asian Cut, Hard Knocks, and others. This is his last episode. Uh, I feel like there's a of our guest stars, Terry Baines. He's an actor and a director. I feel like he should have got a shot directing this. <laughs> It is directed by Robert Isco. This is the only episode that he directed, but he also directed a presentation of the Academy Awards and something called On Strike for Christmas, which sounds like it stars Larry the Cable Guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Before we get started, I can check into each other's lives. Pals, this isn't a normal episode for us. So, and because this isn't really a normal episode of Miami Vice either, in the grand scheme of things, Vice regulars, the Vice team that we love, that we are here for every single week only appear for about three minutes in this entire episode. This is a pilot episode for a new show that NBC or the creators of Miami Vice were trying to kickstart called YCU, which is why you see in the opening credits, it says starring and not the Vice team. Oh, it does after the Vice team, but it, it says starring and then the names of the new characters and then the guest stars are listed separately because this is a true pilot. So question, guys. Do you think that had they gotten Johnny Depp for this pilot that they would have gone ahead with it? <laughs> or, or vice versa? Do you think that 21 Jump Street would have lasted or been canceled if they got Justin Lazard? It would be canceled because it needed giant up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that wasn't the only I'm problem with saying. this pilot, but <laughs> it was, he should have known that Richard Grisco was saying, out there the entire the time. Yeah, seems exactly. similar. <laughs> this is exactly NBC trying to make a 21 Jump Street clone so that they could compete on that now that Vice is coming to an end. Absolutely, this is a 21 Jump Street. Well, as a fan of both shows, I can tell you wholeheartedly they failed. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they just chose the wrong character to try and spin off. There's so many other directions they could have gone. Spin off for Zwitek or, you know, maybe he pals up with Izzy or something. There's so many other options that they could have thrown out there. Joey Harden, why? Stan pairs up with Izzy and it becomes a sitcom like Perfect Strangers. <laughs> <laughs> I'd watch that. <laughs> You'd watch that, exactly. Exactly, instead... <laughs> Instead, we're going to try and rip off a show that the other network network ha already has bigger stars and more appeal for. So our goal here is with this breakdown is that we're not going to do a, as deep a dive on this one because this is a pilot for a different show. And this our show is about Miami Vice. And yes, this made it into the Vice season, but this isn't a Miami Vice episode. So we're going to do a, a quick rundown on this one. Not go too deep like we normally do. We might be a little hard on this one, but we also think it deserves it. So because the Vice regulars aren't in it, no dad, no Switech, no duo, no ladies. Well, the duo for like three minutes. Because of that, yeah. we're going to give this one a quick rundown because this is, we're trying to do everything that is Miami Vice. Uh, but it's going to save ourselves. Save that stamina for too little too late next week. <laughs> so with that being said, let's go half-ass this. <laughs> let's go break this one down. <laughs> So when we open up, I'm already like those damn punks that can't even graffiti write. <laughs> stupid X. What the hell are they even doing at this white people party with topless <laughs> women all over the place? <laughs> <laughs> the first thing jumped out to me is, man, Tubbs and Crockett are the old guys in the club. I mean, I love the jacket. It's not really hiding much on Sunny's face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's his, that's his oh, youth They're look. clearly like 20 years older than everybody. It was the same as with Joey, because he looks like he's a CPA that got lost, and his dad, Sonny, is there to come pick him up. He looks so stupid. Why is he, what is he wearing? What? Why is he wearing that? Why is he trying to fit in in that club wearing that? <laughs> he looks like an extra from a Bon Jovi movie music video or something at the very least he looks better than he did 
in the first time we met him where he's doing like the he- the heavy metal stuff. This is a slight uh-huh. upgrade from that. I don't know. I don't know. Those white it, pants, that yellow it's bandana. Like, it's only a slight upgrade because of the bandana. <laughs> the bandana belt. The yellow bandana belt, too. <laughs> this opens a lot of work for very little because nothing really happens. The They lose whoever that they're, they're supposed to be buddying up with or something. And we see kid struggling to undress a strip for a few minutes but then it jumps to like a real serious scene right after that that actually ha- has a whole lot of meaning just real fast in that bar scene because something that we've all been waiting for is that a man comes up to sunny and says i recognize you you're sunny heat crockett mm-hmm. as in i know you're a cop and he tries to fight him but sunny's able to knock him out like see there are people yep. there are people that know that he's a cop it's closing <laughs> in on him they're closing in on him <laughs> And that's when they lose Peter. Uh, Peter goes up to the roof, and then he makes him like bungee jump or something off the roof onto the concrete. <laughs> bungee jump. He tries to go uh, on the so roof. when he called him when he called him Sunny Heat Crockett. I didn't think that he thought he was a cop. I thought maybe S- Sunny like slept with his girlfriend, and that was like Sunny's nickname. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Joey is in charge of this man named Peter. He's our connection to get closer to Baines, our professor, and is also making the synthetic drugs in this episode. During that kerfuffle, Baines is able to escape with, with Peter. They go up to the roof of this other building, and they convince Peter, while he's on the drug, that he should step off the roof and walk onto the road, which is going to like, it's like the highway to hell or something. It's like that the Rainbow gonna, Bridge or something. Yeah, he's going to step onto. But then instead, he just is falls this to like, death. Is this like the Tide Challenge, or what was that cold water one? Like, is this what the kids were doing back then <laughs> i didn't really understand what he gained by killing them just to kill them that that's what the deal is is it to not so that they don't talk to the cops about what he's doing i don't know the why, why give was the there like then? 20 people there i don't know it's all very confusing and why would everyone else think that was normal too except for one guy yeah Pinky's like oh that's not right but everyone <laughs> else was, is like laughing was getting him the strip just because they felt bad about murdering him like, what was, what was that about? So many questions. If only it had been Joey. That's the important thing. <laughs> they got the wrong person. Yeah, if only Joey had gone <laughs> off that roof, we would be spared the next 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. It's supposed to be d- d- designer drugs. It's happening on campus at the college. Joey is the young kid. He's the one trying to infiltrate. But in the beginning here, he is working with the duo. They're going to try and he's infiltrating and then they're going to be the buyers. And then they're going to be able to bring down Baines. Okay, but that makes more sense. Them as buyers makes more sense than that guy in the suit. (laughs) Yeah, no. When he first showed up, I was like, man, he brought his dad to a drug deal. (laughs) (laughs) After Peter falls to his death, he's like blindfolded and he falls to his death. That's when we go to the opening credits. Before we move on, there's a chance to check in with this week's guest stars. I shouldn't say guest stars because they're the the stars of this episode. They're the new Vice team, I guess you could call them. That's what the plan was. Don't you ever say that again. (laughs) Yep, so we get Justin Lazard, who we've already talked about, Detective Joey Harden. And I mean, he was already in episodes Line of Fire and Miami Squeeze. So I don't think I really need to go too much into it. Pretty much all you need to know about Justin is that anytime he was cast in a pilot or TV series, it was inexplicably canceled very soon after. I'm not saying it's a coincidence. I'm not saying it's him, but he seems to be the common factor just saying joey if we reduced it down to just justin lazard the problem seems to be with you yep (laughs) so moving on we have keel martin who plays captain paul cotter best known for his role as detective jd larroe on hill street blues he actually began in theater in florida in the 60s his early work he did voice work for uh, four mexican fairy tales then he moved to new york worked as a musician a dock worker and even as a uh, stand-up even doing stand-up before he would sign a contract with universal right after signing the contract he would get in a motorcycle crash break 15 bones it would take two years to to get better just the fact that he actually got back into acting and was even remotely successful is impressive those motorcycles have struck <sighs> down so many actors in miami vice he'd go on to do about half a dozen tv movies Our next guest star is kim die cameron die plays detective jack andrews he is an actor and a singer he played fred in the movie 
Alley Girl. Also had roles in The Last Starfighter, National Lampoon's Joy of Sex, Body Rock, Men at Work, and others. He was also married to our next guest star, Laura San Gaikomo. They were married between 90 and 98, and actually, I'm pretty sure they met here on the Vice set. They would marry about a year later. Gaikomo plays Detective Tanya Lewis, uh, and she's actually been in a bunch of stuff. So she's known for playing uh, Cynthia on in the movie Sex, Lies, and Videotapes. She also played Kit DeLua in Pretty Woman, Maya Gallo in the sitcom Just Shoot Me. That is what it is. I was like, it was killing me. Like, And Melissa said like she was in Pretty Woman. I'm like, oh, no, I've never seen that before. And it lists off a couple other things. Like, no, I've never seen that before. But just shoot. That's what I recognize her. That's How where, have you never seen Pretty Woman? That's where I know her from. Yeah, I've never seen Pretty Woman. How is that uh, even I'm with possible? I'm with her from Just Shoot Me. She was like the main. She was like the the, the main character. And she also played Rita Rodriguez in the TNT show Saving Grace from 2007 to 2010, as well as a reoccurring role uh, most recently as Doctor Confalone on NCIS. She's actually hmm. showed up these last couple seasons. Also, because it's like our dad's favorite movie, but she was also the chick from Qu- Quigley Down Under. Oh, yes, she was. Yes, I've seen her yeah. in more stuff than I realized. And you know what? Crazy. Uh, it never crossed whatever. my mind that she has been close to both Mark Harmon and Don Johnson. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> yes, it is. John, wait a minute. We discovered something while doing this research for this. Did you know who they really wanted for NCIS, but they couldn't get because he refused to do it? Not Mark Harmon. Don't, don't say it. Yep, they wanted Don Johnson. He didn't want to do it. No, nope, he turned it down. Also, it they the guy, wanted, It was the guy from Scott earlier Bacula. in Miami Vice that they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> they also wanted Scott Bakula, and he said no. <laughs> <laughs> well, they got him in New, York, New Orleans, so they got Bakula eventually. Apparently, he didn't want to do that so. one. <laughs> Yeah, and so if it wasn't for HBO, they they, they might have got Crockett too. Well, and what we read is that Bacula had said it just didn't work out. Like it wasn't like he just said no or anything; it just didn't work out. But Don Johnson specifically said it was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> like he didn't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark Harmon's having all the way to the bank in their what 18th season as yeah, they continue to crush Don ratings. John- as you in, act like uh, Don Johnson's like, like in the poorhouse or something. <laughs> <laughs> Take that spot I, I'm back, just saying. <laughs> I'm you know, just Don saying, Johnson was um, just in like a movie on, you know, like a real movie that goes to the big screen, you know, <laughs> with Jane Fonda in it. As much as I love to listen to you guys argue <laughs> about this, we do kind of move on. <laughs> a- anyway, been quickly down under with Tom Selleck, so she's been closer to greatness than Don Johnson. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll keep All right, my let's com- move on. Let's keep my on. comments about Tom Selleck to myself. <laughs> Our next guest star is Adam Stork. He plays Detective Ray Mundy. He's best known for playing Julia Roberts' love interest in the 1988 Mystic Pizza. Oh, that that's him. I love that movie, by the way. I don't really even like Julia Roberts, but yes. I like that movie. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as TV, he was in a short-lived series called Prey, Tales from the Crypt episode, and most importantly, an episode of Crossing Jordan. <laughs> Every episode. I'm going to do it to close it out. <laughs> Our next guest star is Jennifer Rubin Claire. She's an actress and model. Believe it or not, she was the original Calvin Klein model for the film Obsession. Uh, her film debut was in 1987, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. Some of her other movies, Bad Dreams and The Crush, more horror movies, The Doors, and Red Scorpion 2, which is probably her best role. I don't know, did, did Red Scorpion 2, do you think that had Dolph Lundgren in it as well? I mean, he's not above it, so. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, he was probably in it. I don't know what else he would be doing. <laughs> this was my favorite part of the, doing the research. She was also in a 1997 spoof film called Plump Fiction. Which, Are we sure that was a spoof way, and plump, not a porn? <laughs> 
Plump Fiction, by the way, has five reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and has a whopping zero percent. Oh, that's right so, in our real house. So our last guest star in the episode is Keith Gordon. He plays Terry Baines. He's an actor and director. His first role was as the class clown Doug in the movie Jaws 2 in 78. Shark food. Next, he was Joe Gideon in a movie called All That Jazz, Christine, and the 85 cult film the Legend of Billy Jean. He was also in Back to School with guess who? Mark Harmon. <laughs> hey, you brought him into this. <laughs> he's mostly played a nerd. In fact, he's played a nerd so many times, he was named the number one nerd, top seven most convincing nerds. <laughs> they find these people Pretty huge these. honor there. <laughs> I want to see the rest of that list. <laughs> as far as a TV director... He has been quite successful. He has directed episodes of Homicide, Life in the Street, episodes of House, Dexter, uh, two seasons, seasons two and three of Fargo, and just a bunch of other crap. A very successful TV. That's why I was saying maybe he should have directed this episode. <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct talking to Sonny. I don't know what the hell Joey's wearing. I think that's a truck strap that he's using as a belt, like one of the metal hooks that he's used to put over yeah, a pallet. I think so too, yeah. yeah Bungee yeah. cord. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, Crockett's trying to work the computer. You can tell he's having a little trouble. For the record, he pulls up the computer. It's like, look at this. It shows like he has to enter in a password. He's like, huh. He thinks about it for a while. He puts in something, and they're like, yes. Like, the dialogue is he's discovered something. It's like, I need to check into this. They show the computer again. It's still at the password screen. It just says <laughs> classified. <Yes. laughs> Joey has no idea. Joey's completely distracted because apparently it's very distracting working in a where all the women dress up like hookers. <laughs> and then Sonny just like fucks off for the rest of the episode to go figure out what's wrong with the computer. And we never see him yeah, again. No, we do. We do. Because he, he no, goes no. to see Cutter. The very next scene, scene. That's right. Come on yeah. now. No, in kidding. the very... In the very next scene, he ran off to go check on that thing. And that thing was playing pool and getting drunk at a bar. This is when we get introduced to Cutter. Apparently, Sonny and Cutter know each other. And Cutter's trying to put together uh, an, an amazing team. Something you might, like, if you start, it might be called an, an A-team. It's like the, the first team, the best team, the A team of young kids called the YCU. And he wants Joey to lead it up because Sonny has been talking up Joey, saying that he's great and he's a great cop. He's, he's taken him under his wing to train Joey. But Sonny doesn't like it because he it's not safe if you have Joey going alone. But Cutter says, no big deal. We have the YCU. I'm going to put in two other people who are young. They can hide They're in there. They're already in there. That's yeah. what it was. They were already and, there. Uh, and then mm -hmm. he'll be safe. Yeah. <laughs> With those two. And they can get in the places old guys can. Really, we're going to throw like, like four guys young looking cops because i don't think any of them are, are technically that young right? well i mean they're all supposed like, to they're be not young giving cops, badges but... to 16 year olds no they're in their 20s that's what it's supposed to be but he also says that they have different jurisdiction and they get their money federally so they can cross lines oh that, yeah that the local police they can do whatever do. they want yeah yeah they have they're... permission from the highest authority dan quayle gave them permission to do whatever <laughs> the hell they want they're as young as luke perry and 90210 <laughs> <laughs> like 35. <laughs> so now we go to the scene that's really important. It's just this shooting range scene where we get to meet the kids or Ray and Zach. We'll meet Tanya later when we put together the rest of that A-list team. This is when the kids, Ray and Zach, are calling out Joey for being a chump. And Joey's got to chump it up and show them that they're chumps because he could chump those shooting targets <laughs> down range really good. And then Joey says... No, nah, never mind. I'm out. You guys aren't. I'm too good for you. Anyway, I only work alone, just like my mentor, Sonny Crockett. <laughs> but Sonny works this whole with scene. Rico. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this whole scene is supposed to be us being introduced to the YCU. Immediately, guys, jumps out at me is uh, a little bit of lack of diversity here. Yeah, that was I the whitest white. group of uh, cops I've ever seen. <laughs> also, if they're trying to go against 21 Jump Street. 21 Jump Street is full of minorities. <laughs> just saying <laughs> and women i mean the well, lieutenant is a i mean i think they covered <laughs> uh, i think they covered all of their bases as far as white people go they have an <laughs> r kansas hick <laughs> well they'll cover one more because when they get to the office and we meet tanya she's the real brains of the operation and she explains how she knows what baines is up to because as a psychology teacher he teaches 
Edgar Allan Poe. Not Sigmund Freud. End of discussion. And why were they acting like she had cracked some code? He's like, I told you, she's the best. She looked that up on the computer and it said, and looked at his curriculum and there you go. <laughs> she looked at his syllabus and she can read. <laughs> the only key part here is that Tanya says that he got defunded and now he's selling drugs himself to continue his research. So that's why they're investigating. Sir. Technologically, before they have someone in the office, there's computers everywhere. She, Cutter says she's the best and they're going to use computers to solve cases because this is about today's youth. <laughs> And then they hand Joey's like, they need to call us. They hand him a baking sheet sized telephone. <laughs> this is wireless. You could carry this with you anywhere you want. No one to. will see it in your back pocket. <laughs> when they were talking about the being financed as a drug dealer, huh? Strange. The local community college doesn't want to fund your your new hip drug. <laughs> Surprising. I don't think my community college would fund my bath lab. <laughs> So now we're going to finally be able to meet Baines. Baines is at his class. He's lecturing. Again, it's for the youth. So that means in the in the classroom, there's TVs all over the place, even though they're only sitting like seven feet away. It's in the dark. It's in the dark. There's TV screens all over the place. So you can just look, look at the screen instead of him. Remember, this is for young people. And young people love them computers and their TV and their MTV. And we're going to, by golly, we're going to remake this into MTV cops and you're going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually learned something from this scene, guys. Did you know that uh, the problem with today is there's not enough schizophrenia? Schizophrenia <laughs> is apparently holiness, and there's just not enough of it. No, seriously, drugs are not fun. They're serious. They're serious because there's just not enough schizophrenia in the world. <laughs> Joey goes and talks to Baines after class. Trying to brown nose his way in there. Meanwhile, Ray is like, what's up, Claire? I saw up, you from baby? across the classroom. And the teacher, he's totally like trying to get out of talking with Joey. Like, hey, man, move, move, move. <laughs> I got to stop Ray like he's, talking he's, to my woman. So and then, so Joey and Ray leave. And Joey gets mad at Ray because he thinks he, he upset him from setting up the teacher and getting in with the teacher. Ray's counter argument is, dude, you were totally cock blocking me. She's totally into me. Like... <laughs> I don't care. Also, you're and boring. He does. <laughs> he is boring. <laughs> Key point here. Joey is the voice of reason. <laughs> Just keep that in perspective throughout this whole episode. Joey is the voice of yeah. reason. But Ray got invited to the to Baines' party that night. And Joey says, well, so did I. I already had an invite. Like, I was already planning on going. So I don't know why I needed your invite. But cool, you got one too. <laughs> so I guess we'll go. And they go to <laughs> Baines' party. Baines is talking to Zach, one of the other police officers that's in the YCU, who's trying to brown nose as well. He is taking the angle of like the needy nerd, not like the not Ray, who's supposed to be like the cool kid, and Joey, the the guy out who's... of work construction worker, <laughs> the guy who's <laughs> showing up even though you don't want him to. <laughs> Joey breaks into Baines's office and almost gets caught, but Ray distracts him with Claire. Like you remember this booty. <laughs> <laughs> this is their first operation undercover together and joey proves one kids are loud and two that they are terrible at snooping around which which is the theme in this episode apparently apparently no one can snoop without just making a crap ton of noise uh, and ray saves his butt ray, ray seriously saves him by dragging her in and making out with her um which is great because then he also he it, it, it's he keeps him from catching Joey, but at the same, he also gets to rub it in the professor's face that I'm totally making out with your girlfriend. <laughs> Joey oh. then does the smart so, move of climbing out the back window, jumping off the balcony, escaping just in time, then going around the block and coming right back up where he was out <laughs> front of the door. Yes. Is like, there was someone in here, and you're. Can I see you in my office for a few minutes, please? I got a knife. I got to show you. Hey, Joey, why are you so sweaty and out of breath? It sounds like you just. <laughs> I'm over a balcony and ran, ran around the corner. Once Baines gets Joey back into the office, he tells them about how there's no families anymore and everyone just watches football. And then he gets out his African knife. He's like, what if I give you one of these? And he like waves it around in front of his face. And Joey says, I'm not afraid. I want to buy some of your drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I want because, to buy drugs from you. That's exactly what because that's would the do. natural thought. Remember, this is, that's exactly how this scene went. Yeah, that's that's what they did. It's like yes. too many people watch football. Here's my African knife. I'm gonna put it up to your face. What do you want? I'm gonna. Aren't you afraid of me? It's like no. I'm gonna buy some drugs. It means like 
okay, let's do this. <laughs> and it's never mind that. Why was he? He knows he was snooping around in the office, right? I mean, that's what it's supposed to be. That's why else is he taking him in there and showing him his knife? Unless he just really did that like Joey, <laughs> like everybody else. Like I met him once. He's annoying. Yeah. I got to show him my knife to get rid of him. (laughs) It's even wackier than that. When he first goes in the office, he turns around and takes a key and locks the door. So he locks himself in with Joey, then does what you said. And then Joey out of nowhere, which seems out of nowhere to just say like, hey, I'd like to buy drugs from you. (laughs) He's like, cool, totally. Well, well, I'll sell you drugs. He gets up and just leaves. But no one ever unlocked the door. (laughs) Oh, he just ran through it. <laughs> so yeah, clearly he knows he was in the office because he locks himself in the office with him before showing him his African stabbing knife. <laughs> Meanwhile, at Ray's place, Ray is having some champagne and, you know, a little, a little pump action with Claire. He's a police officer. And so in the scene, he does like stop himself. He's going to seduce her, I guess, but then pump her for information without having sex with her. Yeah, they don't do that on 21 Jump Street. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> thinks about it but he ends up just giving up he starts to give her that lame lines i like you i'm just not in like with you and when she calls him out he looks her out all panicky for a minute he's trying to come up with something and he just kind of gives up like ah screw it <laughs> <laughs> they roll around for a while place like wrestle underneath the blanket for a few minutes or something i don't know what the hell they're doing it's not having sex that's what, that's for sure what they're not doing <laughs> i mean it's tommy was so level sex if that's what's happening <laughs> He found her belly button. (laughs) Things get really serious where Ray asks her about Baines and she's like, yeah, I used to be really into him. He's so smart, but something's not right with him anymore, especially since Lisa and Peter disappeared one day after talking to him. I'm kind of skeptical now. (laughs) After they're dead and all, I don't know. (laughs) Quick scene at the bar where Joey introduces Baines to the supposed buyer that he has found, uh, who says that he's the Mother Teresa of chemists. But likes to make a profit, which is nothing like Mother <laughs> Teresa. I don't think you no. know what an analogy is. <laughs> Joey brings him in, and then the professor is like, tells Joey to go play over at the kids' table. It's seriously like Joey brought his dad. Like, I'm looking to diver- diversify. I heard there's good money in the drug game. Later that night, JoJo calls Ray and says, Thanks for saving me at Bane's. Ray says, No, JoJo, I, I really appreciate you. And then they hang up, and everything's good and then suddenly claire calls and says i remember something about lisa and peter you should come meet me at baines's office and ray thinks to himself i'm gonna take all the glory on this i'm not gonna tell jojo where i'm going and then he takes off to go with claire when they get to baines's office they're going through all the paperwork and of course like they don't have a lookout don't have they don't know what the hell they're doing they're just going through paperwork talking to each other and baines just sneaks in behind him with piggy my favorite sidekick of all vice sidekicks they're just so bad at snooping like you gotta be quiet guys you can't just loudly talk while you're digging through his desk (laughs) which of course the next day the ycu show up at the waterfront to find ray and claire dead in a car accident in the water (laughs) (laughs) they would drive their car right through that water why do they stick ray's hands in his pants before putting them on the gurney (laughs) weird too i was like way to be rude to the dead that's the way they all know him it's just constantly <laughs> masturbating <laughs> i guess they didn't want his arms to flop around <laughs> they carried him specifically <laughs> in his will there's a dnr <laughs> it stuffed my hands in my pants <laughs> yes yeah, I thought that was weird, too. It's just so weird. Because they, like, zoom in and mortician guy or whatever who's loaded him in the gurney. He up his pants and stuffs his hand in there. <laughs> it's just so weird. That's just his thing. That's what he does to all the dead people. <laughs> <laughs> That's just Bill. <laughs> they argue with Cutter. Zach and Joey are saying, we're out. That's it. Like, once we catch Baines, we're done. We're not going to do this anymore. Kind of tries to tell them, I'm the one that set all this up and knew that Ray was kind of this way, so his death is on my hands. Well, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then Zach, Tanya, and Joey just go run around on the beach chasing understand. birds. On the beach. What the hell is going on? I 
like how they show up and then Joey sees that he's dead. He's like, that's it. We're boned. We're done. Pack it in. We'll never get him now. He's like a little kid who like had a bad birthday party or something. All of them. That's it. I hate my life. All of I'm their reactions. Now. All of their reactions are ridiculous. The other guys jump around like, that's it. No rules. Like total rampage style. Yeah. We're going to get him. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, the YCU office, they're reviewing the details from the Lisa file. Her and Peter came from Broken Homes. So that means, of course, they're going to set up Zach, who that's kind of his character that he's been doing with Baines. He's gonna, they're going to use that to their advantage, and they send in Zach to then tell Baines in his office, I come from a broken home, and my drunk dad beat me for writing a poem. Can you give me some drugs to make me feel better? Am I the only one that thought it was weird because he's like an adult? <laughs> <laughs> so later, Zach wakes up, or he's like stuck in this room, this other room, not the regular office anymore, I think. It's like some observation room that looks like a bedroom. Or yeah, I think they just said, yeah, it's like some yeah. kind of... like. Um, way to at, trap him in a way yeah it, it's like a decorated room he's having a drink of like coffee and now he but he's just like tripping balls now <laughs> <laughs> and Bane yeah i think they've all are watching from outside uh, first of all this drug bliss it doesn't look very fun i think they might need a new name and i think it's already been invented i think it's called acid <laughs> <laughs> It might even be PCP because Zach then flips out. Bane says, go in there and get him. His two muscles go in there and Zach handily destroys them and runs out of the place down the street. Still tripping bad. Joey sees them, races. Oh, sorry. He, like, he can hear on the radio yeah. what's happening. So he lets them get all jacked up. And then so, when he escapes, yeah, then he goes him, in. Though. <laughs> well, and while he's escaping, the whole frame, the way he's viewing this on drugs is like that terrible music video, the the aha, take on me music video. <laughs> what a lame thing to have a trip about. Like, like really? Of all the music videos, aha uh -huh, <laughs> is the one you're going with? So Zach is on the freeway. Joey rescues him before he's getting hit by before he gets hit by a truck. Who he imagines is a boat, and he says, "I'm missing my, I'm missing the boat." So wasn't he just going to get hit by the boat? Then? Question, question for the group here. <laughs> '80s movies. Whenever someone runs onto the freeway, there's always a semi. And the semi is laying on their horn. How come semis never stop? <laughs> They're not like a train, right? Where they can't. No. <laughs> Every semi is just like, ah, ah, I'm not letting off the gas. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to run you over. You <laughs> ah, screw it. Because <laughs> they got a job to do, okay? They got to deliver some stuff. They might, be, they might be Optimus Prime. You never know. <laughs> they got things to do. Yeah, they got schedules and stuff to meet. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, those tomatoes have got to get to the Heinz ketchup plant somehow. They, they pay um, per load, okay? <laughs> they get paid per load. I just disappointed. I was kind of hoping for like, you know, like that scene in Bride of Chucky where the guy just gets hit by the truck and just explodes. Like I was oh, hoping I he was going to explode and then, and then <laughs> the Joey, Jojo would be the last of the YCU jo team. Jo so jo like when they start the new show, <laughs> they'd have to hire a whole new team. <laughs> And then the whole first season, it'd be like, what happened to the first team? <laughs> I mean, playing in theater at this time is Pet Cemetery, and that's got a truck scene in it, too. Those trucks are terrible in Pet mm -hmm. Cemetery. <laughs> Real fast at Baines' office, Joey is telling Baines that night, we're messed up. The cops are going to be all over this. You have people running around on the street, and you have our person that we're making the deal with is going to back out now. And Baines says, don't worry. Let me take care of it. We're going to go over to Harrison Hall. I'm going to take care of all of this because apparently having someone jump off the roof is going to fix everything. I still don't get why he would want that. It just causes so much like heat around him, right? That someone that was in his class, all these people are in his class and they keep jumping to their death. And what is he learning them jumping to their death on their on his drug? Isn't he just learning that this drug isn't going to make him a lot of repeat business? Well, I don't think he cares about learning anything because he says in this scene or later on, he says like he got like a taste for it and for watching people die. And then mm. once he gets a taste for it, he can't stop himself now, basically. Oh, so this isn't about the drug at all. He just wants people to jump on. He's, he's yep. just trying to get people to jump off the dormitory. He's just the worst to, frat I, we've ever. Uh, sorry, <laughs> this is the worst frat we've ever uh, we've ever pledged for. I think he just wants to be in all power, right? To be like to know that he mentally, basically, coerced someone into doing these things on his drug, and also with his supervision that he told them to do it, and they just mm -hmm. did it. And that's exactly what his plan is here on the final episode or the final scene of the episode. There's one a little one at the end here, but the main episode. This is the final scene. They get. 
Zach up there is blindfolded, just like at the very beginning. And now Baines is convincing Joey to talk Zach to jump off the building. But Zach, at some point in time, has sobered up. So he's not going to buy this whole spiel. He gets to the very edge. They stop and turn around after Baines tells him, keep going, Jojo. This is how I did it with Peter and with Lisa. And they're able to hear on the wire that his confession. And so now Cutter's going to move in. They turn out their guns drawn. They actually get Piggy and the team to surrender. But then a janitor comes upstairs like, what the hell are you damn kids doing up here? <laughs> Distracts Jojo and Zach. They take the janitor hostage. And then it looks like that Baines is going to get away. And then Cutter makes it up. And then it's a Donnybrook. First of all, good old professor tries to throw the whole, oh, too bad you didn't get me on. Uh, too bad you're not wearing a wire. I, I mean, I guess you got to take a stab at it, you know? <laughs> yeah, man. What poor timing for that poor maintenance guy. You know he was just going up to the roof to, like, grab a smoke on his break, you know? <laughs> Shows up, there's like, 30 people on the roof with guns drawn. Like, what the hell? This is exactly when we see that Joey has learned everything from Sonny. Because when he wrestles with Baines, he immediately throws them off the roof. <laughs> I know. Like, I'm like, yep. Learn that from Sonny. And somehow he's not able to hold on to him. He didn't try very hard. No. No, no. It's like, okay, yeah. we'll see ya. This is less paperwork. <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, the grown-ups show up at the very end. And some people are arrested. <laughs> the next day, while they're cleaning up the scene, Cutter talks to the YCU. Zach and... Jojo and Tanya all miss Ray, but they, they're just going to keep going because they're the misfit group that should never be. And Cutter invites them out for dinner and uh, some frosty milkshakes. <laughs> <laughs> Freeze frame on Cutter and Joey, and that's the end of the episode. And thank God it's, it's the end uh, of that show. <laughs> just that last last scene, the next day, like the day after. They are all extremely upbeat considering... That this is probably the worst start they could have had for the YCU. I mean, one of your undercover officers got murdered in the middle of the investigation. This isn't like, good job, little difficult start, but we got it done. No, <laughs> no, no. You guys completely screwed this up from beginning to end. It just happened to work out because the guy was crazy. <laughs> I'm sure we have lots of final thoughts on this episode, but we'll save those for after music because in music, we actually have some, you know, for the episode that we got here, the crap episode that we got, we got some good music. So let's go break down this week's music. All right, John, did a quick peek at this week's music, and I saw someone named Tom Tom. So I'm excited. <laughs> what do you got for us this week? Well, yeah, we have the Tom Tom Club, who, uh, with their song, Kiss Me When I Get Back. They were a new wave band. Actually, they are two of the founding members of the band The Talking Heads. Their husband and wife team, Tina Weymouth and Chris France, who were the original bassist and drummer of the band The Talking Heads. So The Talking Heads were actually a, a, a hugely critically acclaimed band in the 80s, and they formed 1975 in New York. The Tom Tom Club was founded in 1981 during one of The Talking Heads breaks. So the band was on hiatus, and they decided to do a side project, and they actually named the club after the music hall in the Bahamas where the band practiced. They had immediate early success in the dance club scene. They had actually go on to release six albums. Outside of the Tom Tom Club and the Talking Heads, they produced multiple albums for Ziggy Marley and the Melody Makers, as well as providing backup vocals for the Gorillaz' debut album. Our next artist is Eddie Brinko and the New Bohemians with their song What I Am, and they're an alt-rock jam band. This was from their album Shooting Rubber Bands at the Stars. They were a Texas band formed in the mid-80s. They were actually the New Bohemians at first. <clears throat> they would play the local scene, open for Bo Diddley once, stuff like that. After seeing a, some success locally, they released a couple albums. After the second album, Ghost of a Dog, in 90, uh, Eddie would actually leave the band. The band wouldn't actually last much longer, pretty much fold after that. She was in the band for two albums. She started seeing some success, and then they were doing SNL. She met Paul Simon. They hit it off. 
she married Paul Simon and went away and she's married to Paul Simon, actually, I think. Well, there she she won out in that one. <laughs> also, got in a little bit in the acting around the same time. She had a role as the folk singer in the 1989 Born on the Fourth of July. She actually covers a Bob Dylan song uh, in that movie. Most recently, she's been collaborating with Steve Martin, which uh, if you are aware of Steve Martin, as far as what his stand-up comedy act is that he still goes around and does, it, it largely involves him playing, a, a lot of it playing his banjo. And so she collaborated with Martin on, on one of his albums for that and toured with him a little bit as the most recent thing she's done. He is an amazing banjoist. Yeah. <laughs> is that what you would for it to it is yeah he has albums <laughs> and stuff he's he has whole concerts just for that oh yeah, yeah. It has nothing to do with the comedy yeah he's he does folk, he does folk music yeah he's got like just yeah he's got like 12 albums playing like bluegrass banjo uh folk music okay so our last song is this little known band called gnr i don't know what it's abbreviated for yeah I mean, it's for their song paradise city yeah you know it's 1989 it's it's the end of the eighties. Like hair bands, they're just not going to make it anymore. Arena rock, it's just not a thing anymore. Yeah. These guys, I know they think they have these big dreams, but they should just hang it up. So obviously, we are just fun. Guns and Roses, the massive band that they are, and their Ooh. song Paradise City. They're a hard rock <laughs> band formed in nineteen eighty five. So the original lineup, once they released an album, was Axl Rose slash Izzy Stradlin, Duff McKagan, and Steven Adler. Now that's Fairly common knowledge if you are into rock music or, or that type of stuff, right? Yeah. I was not aware that the band was born when the two bands, Hollywood Rose and L.A. Guns, merged to form mm. Guns N' Roses. And it was actually because Izzy Stradlin was uh, living with Tracy Guns and uh, Izzy was in Hollywood Rose. Tracy Guns needed a vocalist, a vocalist for LA Guns. And so Izzy recommended Axel. The two bands would merge and within about a period of six months, most of, and this is where it's a little weird saying that it's a merger of the two bands because pretty much most of the original members, most of the members from LA Guns who merged in the Hollywood Rose would immediately be replaced in the first six months by Slash, <laughs> Duff McKagan, and Steven Adler. After replacing them with Slash, McKagan, and Adler, Tracy Guns would quit. So officially, they would be back to being Hollywood Rose, except they just stole their na LA Guns name. So now they're Guns and Roses. And Tracy Guns, whose last name's Guns, out of a band. <laughs> they're one of the biggest bands in the world they've sold over 100 million records they were inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame in 2012 and their debut album debut album appetite for destruction 1987 that album has sold over 30 million albums which is the most of a debut album ever sweet child of mine is their only number one hot 100 and it's actually off of this this debut album turns out the story behind that album it wasn't immediately popular on their first tour both the vans they were traveling in would break down on their way to seattle they would have to abandon all their gear and hitchhike back to la <laughs> following that they would record release their first album they recorded, and they actually recorded, Life for Destruction, they recorded everything in a month except for Axel's vocals. Which, in Axel Rose fashion, he insisted on recording one line at a time, which <laughs> took forever. <laughs> Why? Why? And then when they released it, Appetite for Destruction lingered for a year, selling very, very, very few albums. It lingered for so long that founder... Geffen Records, David Geffen, personally convinced MTV executives to play Welcome to the Jungle during their after hours rotation to try and sell some records. They would play it once or twice at like the 4 a.m. slot and it would mm. blow up. Their journey from there, so the, despite catapulting to success, they would have to fire Steven Adler at the end of the 80s, which is due to way too much coke and heroin. Guy was just doing way too many drugs. Uh, and he would say, he actually says that they tricked him into giving away his rights, $2,000. But that's not the first time that the band or Axl Rose is going to be accused of this. So the band pretty much spent most of their 90s having to find fill-ins for their shows due to random injuries, people being fired or quitting the band, riots at shows, and just 
Plainly, Axl Rose's just bizarre behavior. By 1984, they had released five albums. From 94 to 96, they would sporadically release. And at the same time, Slash would start doing some side project with his side band, Slash's Snake Pit. But there was already major conflict in the band. Axl says that his lack of writing in those years is because of the criticism he was getting from Slash and McKagan and his ex-wife over the stuff he was writing. So, like, Axel doesn't think Slash's stuff is good enough. Slash doesn't think Axel's stuff is good enough. No one's getting along. They would cover the Rolling Stones song, Sympathy for the Devil, to be used in two big films at the time. And then almost immediately after that, Slash would quit the band. Matt Sorum, who had come in as a replacement for, I believe, Adler, he would be fired, and then McKagan would resign, all between 96 and 97. And each time a member left the band, Axel would just hire a new, nem- a new member to replace them. So the band actually never broke up. Axel just kept replacing people. After Slash and them would leave, after everybody had left, it would come out that the full rights to the band, that Axel had purchased the full rights to the band at the end of 97. Slash sees it differently. Slash claims that the band was forced to sign over their rights way back in 92 during a concert in order to get him to go on stage like he was refusing to go on stage unless they signed this paper and so they signed it just to get him to go on stage before a concert and then years later they broke up he busted and said no 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 i already own your rights so obviously legalese ensue and nothing was ever really reported about how the legalities worked out, but essentially, I'm pretty sure Axel owns the majority of their music. So Axel just continued with Guns N' Roses. He would replace the band members and eventually release Chinese Democracy in 2008. Now think about this. From 97 till 2008 to record one album. And he was recording the whole time. Yeah, I've heard the horror stories about Chinese yeah, it, democracy, and it is a mess. Guns N' Roses never broke up. They never went away. Axl Rose just took 10 years to make a single fucking album, <laughs> probably doing it one line at a time, or this time, probably one word at a time. <laughs> Slash would go on to start a band with McKagan and Strandlin called Velvet Revolver, who would be popular enough in new enough music that he'd never really have to care about his, losing his rights to Guns N' Roses. Duff McKagan, he also, other than doing Velvet Revolver, he joined Jane's Addiction for a while, as well as his most recent band is a band called Walking Papers, and they're fantastic. You should totally check them out. And Steven Adler, he had a couple side bands himself, but most notably what he's done since being fired is go on Dr. Drew's Celebrity Rehab. He's a mess on there. He's really bad. Like, his brain is oh, yeah. bad. Mm-hmm. Real bad, bad. So, yeah, that's pretty much the story of Guns N' Roses. Well, um, John, I would love to continue to talk Guns N' Roses, especially talk about how there's a timeline where Guns N' Roses and ACDC become the same band. But that's a story for a different <laughs> day. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. Because like Guns N' Roses, it's really a one-man show and the one man is crap. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this one. All right, Molson, you're going to kick us off here on our final thoughts. You, Vice Regular, Vice deep into the Vice world, where does Leap of Faith fit for you? At the very bottom, in the trash can, (laughs) where it belongs. (laughs) To give you an example, when I watch the show, you know, when I go through it again and again and again, I skip that episode. And that's the only episode I skip. (laughs) It's trash. (laughs) Trash. Thank God they were only in it for... The duo was only in it for two minutes and Crockett only in it for five minutes. So it doesn't tarnish their record. (laughs) And I would just like to say that they didn't, they were not going to stop making the show until Joey showed up. That's why they didn't have a season six. He tanked another show. Yes. Tanked another one. John, what are your final thoughts? I mentioned it a little bit earlier during the... While we were breaking it down, it feels like their attempt at a spinoff was rushed. It feels like they weren't expecting to get canceled and at the very last minute tried to throw out a spinoff idea to just try and get something out of the rest of the show. I guess, I don't know. I just feel like there are so many other characters over the five seasons that we've seen. They've could have gone with so many other different characters to spin off of this show. Well, they would go with 
Joey Harden makes so little sense. And it's just, it was there. This is a classic spinoff pilot. They did this NCIS spun out of JAG the same way. All the CSIs and NCISs, they all spun out the same way. Bones spun a few shows out this way. Like, this is the way it works. You take a popular show. You basically put the pilot episode in that show to try and see and try and get that, that show popular before you show the first episode. And it was just, this episode is just so bad with the acting, with the choices of the detectives. And I made light of the lack of diversity, but I mean, clearly, like, these guys are just terrible actors. Even if they had gotten, like, halfway decent actors, like, maybe the show worked. Just everything about it was just so bad. I can imagine there just had to have been at least one person in that embassy boardroom that ha- that talked sense into everybody. They're like, this is just so awful. We can't <laughs> spin this off, guys. We can't even sell it to USA. It's that bad. <laughs> and outside of that, from a plot perspective for their pilot episode, one, they don't do any favors for the YCU. Don't you think you want to make them look effective and good? Wow, they're really kicking butt. No, you make them look pretty uh, pretty incompetent and immature and pretty bad at their jobs. Pretty much Tanya is the only one who she does 95% of the work in the case as far as the case is concerned. So it's like it's not surprising that she's the one that goes off and actually has a successful acting career after this. Like (laughs) at the end of the day, I think Melissa's right. I think Justin Lazard killed another show. He's a murderer. (laughs) He kills shows. I'm not going to disagree with anything that you guys said. This is a terrible episode where but where i'm going to focus here on and just to be clear this is not a miami vice episode miami vice would never make something this bad <laughs> what i'm going to focus on here is their choice for to have this one my like I, I can't understand where they come from that the vice audience will continue to watch ycu that doesn't make any sense to me that their pilot that they're going to pitch for a spinoff that vice who have started as uh, MTV cops and now have grown up and we've grown with the characters throughout the 80s to get to this point to say, you know what the problem is? Is that not only are the Vice team too old, but they were too old to begin with. We're going to go so far back that we're basically going to go to the cradle to start this new division of the Miami police. I don't understand how this was ever going to get people to follow this show from Vice to YCU. I also have a big question about why they decided to put this at this spot in the season. You can say they did try to do a spinoff earlier in Vice history where they did Crime Story, which isn't a true spinoff, but it is a spinoff of a Vice character that is for the older audience. And that didn't work either. It lasted for about two seasons and then it got canceled. Not to say that Crime Story is a failure. It didn't turn into Miami Vice. It it didn't go for more than two seasons. YCU? too young so they kind of threw their hands up like oh well i guess we can't do anything about this but the big question for me is why in this spot if it if the whole season had aired on nbc this would be the second to last episode or the third to last episode of all of miami vice this is in the wrong spot this should have aired at like episode four as a pilot and then they could have run ycu concurrently with miami vice which is a more common Mm -hmm. way that you run a pilot than a short run first season during the bigger show's regular run. So if Miami Vice was on Fridays at 9 o'clock, YCU was on Fridays at 10 o'clock, and it was immediately on after Miami Vice. They did neither. This was set up to fail from the very beginning. Justin Lazard, you got blood on your hands. (laughs) Or they had the perfect opportunity to develop a character in the Sonny Burnett arc that then spun out into its own show. But no. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goewiththeheat at gmail.com. Check out the website, goewiththeheat.com. We have two episodes of Miami Vice remaining. Now, it's not all that we have left to Go With The Heat. We have those two episodes. We have our season five breakdown. We have our Miami Vice as a whole show recap. That means four episodes left of this Go With The Heat podcast before we come to the very end. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what you think about the show. Send us some love notes. We take some love. Just was Valentine's Day. We would love to get your love notes. Send it over to go with the heat at gmail.com. Or you can get us on Twitter. You can get us on Facebook. You can get us on Instagram. Guess what? 
all at go with the heat check out that website you can find all the ways to subscribe all the ways to contact us and all the ways to support the show we would love to see your support we'd love to hear from you that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all next time bye pals